If you have your Bibles, you might want to open them up to Matthew. I think it's chapter 12. And try to find verse 46, because we're going to only read about four verses. This morning, I want us to honor the women in our lives. Not just, just, not just mothers, but in most churches, in our church particularly, but in other churches that I have been a part of, the women are really a, 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 the strong point in a church. If the women can get along in a church, the church is strong. You know, men have a tendency to handle things differently. We men, we'll duke it out and then we'll, we'll be fine, hug each other and be brothers again. But you know, when women can get along and work together in a church, it's, an, it's amazing what happens in the church. And you know, we, we just need to take time to honor the ladies in our lives. And in doing so, uh, we're going to focus this morning on mothers and women. But folks, if you are a gentleman here this morning, if you are a man, the message is also for us too, not just for women. Um, and I think you can take something from this. But I have discovered, I'm, I'm what, 62 now, and I have discovered there's a difference between men and women. A, a big difference between men and women. Wouldn't you agree? Am, am I stating an obvious, is, is, that, is, is that obvious? Uh, right? Well, a friend of mine is convinced that computers must be female, not male. Now these are his observation, not mine, so don't, don't shoot the messenger. But he gave me five reasons why he believes that women uh, or that, that computers are female. First, no one but their creator can understand their internal logic. You know, it's, it's kind of funny, but think about it. Who, who knows better than anyone than the person that created you? Even your smallest mistakes are immediately committed to memory for future reference. I don't hear any laughter. There must be too many women here. <laughs> the native language used to communicate with other computers is incomprehensible to everybody else. The message, bad command or file name, is about as informative as, if you don't know why I'm mad at you, then I'm certainly not going to tell you. Guys, can you relate? Bob's starting to laugh. And as soon as you make a commitment to one computer, you find yourself spending half your paycheck buying accessories for it. Well, what do you think? Am I in trouble? But men and women are completely different. Huh? They do have a motherboard in the computer. We won't go there. You know what? I'm just going to move on. We do appreciate you ladies. There was a father and son that were talking together one day. And the father asked his son what he wanted for his birthday. And the, the boy thought and, and he said, you know, Dad, I want a baby brother. And his birthday wish came true. Just before his actual birthday, his mom had a second child. And he got his baby brother. So the following year, the father again started talking to his son and said, son, what would you like this year for your birthday? But this time, the little boy was a little hesitant. He was kind of sheepish. He didn't know how to answer. And he, and he said very sincerely, with a, with, a, with a grateful heart, but with a sincere heart, he said, Dad, you know, I really would like a pony, but I'm afraid that would be too hard on Mom. <laughs> so, um, and... You know, there are a number of Mother's Day cards that either have already arrived or will be arriving soon if they're not already here. You, you mail your card here in Tucson, it goes to Phoenix and it has to come back to Tucson. I don't get it. But Mother's Day's card, this must be the best all-time Mother's Day card ever. 
On the front of the card it says, Now that we have a mature adult relationship, there's something I'd like to tell you. And you open the card, and inside the card it says, You're still the first person I think of when I fall down and go boom. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? When we're in pain, we sometimes want to go to our mothers. This is Mother's Day, and we celebrate Mother's Day, but do you know the history behind Mother's Day? Mother's Day actually has its roots in the Christian church. Back in um, a small town called Gafton, West Virginia, a small Methodist church, there was an idea that a Sunday school teacher, her name was Anna Reed Jarvis. Anna Reed Jarvis' daughter is credited with, with getting Gafton to celebrate the first Mother's Day in 1907. In 1909, it had already spread from West Virginia into Pittsburgh, and the city, in 1909, the city of Philadelphia decided to pick up on the idea. By May 8th, which, isn't that, it's an interesting date, because what is today? The 9th? So it's very close to where we're at. On May 8th, on 19, in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson designated the second Sunday of May as the official celebrations of Mother's Day in the United States. Started in a little church in West Virginia, and now we celebrate Mother's Day every second Sunday in, in May. So, um, we're honoring women, not just mothers. You know, there are, there are some of you given, given birth, you've adopted a child, some of you are surrogate mothers, some of you are um, Somebody chose you to be their mother, or maybe you've just raised children. Um, but we want to honor women in our lives today, and the best way to do that is, is found in Matthew 12, verse, verses 46 through 50. This is not an expository message. This is a, to this is a topical message, um, because there's a lot in these four verses but I, want to, I just want to pick up on one theme, okay? As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. And Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and says, look at these. Uh, look, these are my mother these are my mother and brothers. Verse 50 is the key verse. Anyone who does the will of God in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Anyone who does the will of God is my brother, my mother, and my sister. What's he trying to say there? He's saying anybody who is part of and doing the will of God is part of the family of God. And so... On Mother's Day, we, we honor the women in our church, and we honor their lives. It doesn't matter whether you, you adopted a child, it doesn't matter whether you gave birth to a child, it doesn't matter if you don't have a child, it doesn't matter if you're married or unmarried. Jesus says that the true moms in the kingdom of God are women who do the will of God. So if we're going to follow the biblical guidelines of who to honor, then we need to follow these guidelines and honor the women in our lives. Before we do, we need to look at how we dishonor them. And ladies, listen, I'm not talking to the men, I'm talking to each of us in here. Every one of us. How do we dishonor women in our lives? What is the, what is the opposite of honor? Of course, it's honor and disgrace. So we dishonor and bring disgrace to women in our lives when we are what? Undisciplined. Undisciplined. Look at Proverbs 29, 15. To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. We say we love our moms, we say we love women, but oftentimes our actions sometimes speak louder than words, doesn't it? Amen. I have two moms. I have a mom who gave birth to me, I have a stepmother. Um, and my, my struggle is going back and forth between families. Where do I fit? 
where I've had, I'm very proud and, and honored and, and I'm very respectful because I'm watching Preston and Alicia with uh, Cammy, that's Savannah's mom, and how they, they work hard to get along so that Savannah doesn't feel si slighted in any way. You know, and that's a difficult thing. But our actions, or our lack of actions, show genuine honor or dishonor. So we dishonor and bring disgrace to the women in our lives when we are undisciplined, and we dishonor and bring disgrace to the women in our life when we fail to see their value. When we fail to see their value. What does that mean? We have we we haven't hooked we haven't got our misters working outside on the patio because we're not meeting out in the patio too much. We just let's face it, a dry cold in the fellowship hall beats a wet heat out in the patio. But many people put misters up around their patio, a lot of restaurants, and when they're working right, you, you know how they work, right? They put water into a into a pipe, and they have little tiny nozzles that pushes that water almost out like a vapor. And when the air is so dry, and, and those misters are working uh, exceptionally well, it does seem to cool down the air in the surrounding area where they're being used. But notice that how quickly the mist dissipates in the dryness of, of, the, of our desert heat, right? Particularly in, like in June. And that comes out, and there's hardly any drops of droplets on the ground because it just evaporates so quickly. The word in, in Scripture, when it talks about value, okay, or dishonor, the word dishonor, literally means something like a micromist or a vapor. To dishonor somebody or someone in the Bible was to treat that person as if they weren't even there, like a mist. It had no weight, no value, dishonor. Unfortunately, men do not have an, a monopoly in this, in, this, in this area where we dishonor women. In fact, men may, be, may get the brunt of the situation, but women do this with each other probably as much as men. Men are accused of being insensitive. But over, the, over a period of time, I have watched women who were vicious to one another. At one time, Alicia was a manager at a store. And she got along okay with the guys, but her biggest problem came with uh, subordinates who were other women. So some of you have been in the workplace. Have you noticed that? That sometimes, sometimes your greatest conflict ha deals with other women. Now, all of us can be, can be caught up with our own interests. How do we dishonor women in our lives? We dishonor women in our lives because we don't value them. We dishonor them when we ignore their opinion when we stop listening. By the way, this deals with any person in any gender. We dishonor people when we ignore their opinion. We stop listening to what they have to say. We don't care if a person is present in the church or absent from the church. There are some people who are not here today that probably need to be here. Or maybe we'd like to see them here. But you know, we don't, we don't care about them, so we don't even know that they're gone. We disvalue them. We talk with disrespect about them. We make fun of them. We ridicule their actions. We speak to them or treat them as if they have no feelings. But Romans 12, 10 says this, love each other. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So not only are we ordered to, to love each other with genuine affection, uh, with genuine af affection we are to have a great time doing it. Delight in doing it. 
I, some, you know, I, I have been, and you probably have been in some meetings or some social gathering, you get, oh, here comes so-and-so. Oh, this, this is not going to be good. We've all been there. I'm just, I'm just stating the obvious. We are to love each other with a genuine affection, and then we need to do so with delight as we honor each other. Now, as an otter personality, you know, uh, if something is work to me, I try to find the fun in the work. Okay, it, I, I'm, I'm, a type, I'm the type of person who, you know, I love work, I really do, I can watch it all day long. But I, I just, when it, comes, when it comes to work, I've got to find the play in the work. And sometimes for me, when I see a certain person, I've got to find some sort of game to play in order to love them genuinely, to, to, to delight in honoring them. And I make, it a, I make it a fun time. Now, some of you are not otters. Some of you are lions, and you like to roar and show your teeth more than anything else. Because that's just the way God made you, and that's not bad. So it may be a little harder. But we need to honor each other. And rather than disgracing and dishonoring one another. So here we come to the main thing. The main thing is this. How can we honor the women in our lives? We've talked about how we dishonor them. Let's talk about how we honor them. First of all, we can treat the women in our lives as, tre with, as valued treasure. Valued treasure. Paul tells Timothy, in a, in a wealthy home, there are dishes made of gold and silver, as well as some made from wood and clay. The expensive dishes are used for guests, and the cheap ones are used in the kitchen or to put garbage in. Listen, there are some things that are made for a noble pur purpose, and there are some things that are not made for a noble purpose. And Paul tells Timothy, special things are put in special containers. Also, garbage is not put in something that's valuable. My, my stepfather got some dishes, some china dishes from... His, step, his stepfather when he passed away. And they're cleaning, out, they're cleaning out the house. And my dad found a little tiny, I think it was like, like a finger bowl or something, very small bowl. And he set it down. And they're stomping out their cigarettes in this bowl. And then until they found out how much, how much the, that china was worth. One little finger bowl literally was worth hundreds of dollars. And they looked at this little thing that they had put their cigarettes in, and there was no cleaning it out now. You know, it, the, the, the stomping of the cigarettes, it, it ruined the bowl. We don't put garbage in things that are valuable, right? We don't do that. The gospel of salvation is what? The most precious thing God has given us. And where has he placed the gospel of the, 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 uh, the gospel of salvation. Where he, what vessels has he placed that in? You and I. He has gone to the troubles that you and I can have the gospel of salvation stored in our lives. Which means that God values us a great deal. <coughs> because God can transform ordinary down-to-earth vessels into something that's a lot more precious. People who live inconsistent lives are like cheap pots holding precious gifts of salvation. I was going to do this this morning, but I just ran out of time. Uh, I think I've shared this before, but one of the things, it, when, when we have two dogs, uh, again, I told you, none of them, belong, they don't belong to us, we just, I don't know, they just live there. We let, bring them in, we feed them, and we have to pick up their messes. And we have a, five, a little five-gallon plastic container that we put the dog messes in to dump in the garbage. 
You know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, you get the picture? What if, what if I brought out one of my wife's treasured china bowls to book the dog messes in? You think, you think I would be alive that day? You know? Because certain things go in certain things. And dog messes don't go in something that's valuable. So we honor the women in our lives by seeing them as valued treasures. The same is true how we treat women. We need to view them as God sees them. People who contain, uh, people who contain in their bodies, in their personalities, in their gifts, in their spiritual passion, the good news of Jesus Christ in the godly that virtues connected with being a child of God. What does that mean? It means we protect them from slander and snide comments from others. It means that we go out of our way to see that they succeed. It means that we give them encouragement. We focus, our, we focus on their good points. Folks, people don't need to point out my bad points. I can do that all by myself. We mention them frequently in our conversation in good and uplifting ways. We honor we can treat women and honor them and by seeing them as valued treasures. We can honor women in our life by remembering. The term remembering. In Psalm 63 is an example of David honoring God through, rem through remembering. Okay, So follow along in, in Psalm 63, 1 through 7. O oh God, Paul, uh, David writes, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for, uh, thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and, your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life, better than life itself and I, how, how I praise you. I praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy, oh, I'm going to stop right there. We have all of these ideas about prayer. Solemn, hands together, head bowed, eyes closed. Heaven forbid we lift up our heads and our hands to God and actually pray sincerely to him. Well, Baptists don't do that. Christians do. Maybe Baptists don't. You, listen, Christians do. A religion can't. People can. You see, what I'm, you see the difference, what I'm trying to say? If Christ is in your life, you may worship in a Baptist church, which is good. We have some good qualities, but we're not perfect. But a Christian in a Baptist church, it's okay to raise your hand. Just don't slap the person next to you. That's all. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you're not experienced at doing this. I, I showed that little comedian, right? Maybe you just need to time to do this, you know, to get going. You know, uh, whatever you need to do. It's okay to lift up your head and pray in your hands and pray to God. Now, I would suggest if you're doing 75 miles an hour down the freeway, you probably want to keep your hands on the wheel. All right? I'm just saying that's practicality. But I will tell you, there have been many a times God and I have had a conversation as we drove down the freeway. My head wasn't bowed, my eyes wasn't closed. I had both hands on the wheels looking around and me and God was just carrying on a conversation. That was just free, you don't need to worry about it. I have seen you in your sanctuary, a case upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. I, how I praise you. I praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest of feasts. I praise you with songs of joy. I lay awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your protecting wings. We honor women in our lives by remembering the influence they had on your life. There's a, there's a movie 
It's an older movie. It was an independent movie called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Remember that one? My Big Fat. And this one lady is somewhat embarrassed by her family because they're loud, they're obnoxious, they're, they're kind of embarrassing, and they do some weird things. Her sister is really doing weird things. But before her wedding, her grandmother and her mother and her sister and the ladies are all sitting around. And how they got to where they, at, where they were right then and there. How they left their, their oppressed country and came to the United States. And how they have thrived. And they were, they were thinking about and remembering. And the bride in, in the wedding, the bride began to, re, to remember the love and the support. Not always the greatest of support, but the support that she had from her family, from her family members, and the influence of her mom and her grandmother and her sisters. We just need to remember. But don't get stuck, however, in nostalgia. We have one of the great things. You know, somebody said the other day they were worried about, just a side note, they were worried about this, the new technology. Because you know what, the, with the new, you know what the biggest problem with the new technology in the world is? People can't forget. God has got a great computer up here in our head. Now some of, some of you, some of this computer in your head functions better than others, but we're, we got a great system here. And the greatest thing is we remember sometimes the good stuff and not the bad stuff. We sometimes remember, remember the great times. And I, you know, I remember how sad it was when Gina lost her father and, and the struggle that we had with that. But there are times today, I, I don't remember those pains and, and that grief. What I remember is the other stuff that's worth remembering. Because our, you know, our God understood that we can't hang on to everything. We've got to let it go. And, and I think we sometimes get stuck, stuck in nostalgia. Gee, the 50s were so good, or the 60s were so good. The 70s, we don't know about the 80s or 90s, but, you know, we, got, we get stuck there. And we don't grow. But in remembering, it should help us move forward. It should, when we remember the past, it should move us and propel us forward. A wise church leader said, A living church is one that remembers the past, lives in the present, and works for the future. We can never go back to the past, but we should remember what others have done to help us grow in our faith. We honor women in, 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 who are in our lives by treating them as valued treasured, treasures, and we, we honor them by remembering, remembering. You know what? Being a woman and a mother in this day and age is, has never been easy. It, 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 actually, it's never been easier. I think now it's probably even harder. Peer pressure, there are the pressure of society it's so weird. I, I mean, it's just strange. I, I don't know how to say it any other way. It's just strange. If you're watching at home, I, maybe you can attest to this. It's just strange. It's as if, it's as if mothers do not matter or fathers don't matter. Give your kids to somebody else or something else to raise them. And that's a terrible thing. I don't care if if you, if whether biological, adoptive, or or a woman who follows God's will, it's not easy. Someone said, if being a mother was going to be easy, they never would have started out with having something called labor. All of you women are to be appreciated and are deserving of the highest honor. Let me close with a statement and a prayer. The statement is made by Teddy Roosevelt. He says, when all is said, it is the mother, 
I'm going to stop. This is, this is the former president of the United States. And these words probably are not politically correct, but they are truly sound wisdom. When all is said, it is the mother and the mother only who is, better, who is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother, the mother who does her part in rearing and tra training uh, right, the boys and girls who are to be men and women of the next generation, is of greater use to the community and occupies, if she would only realize it, a more honorable as well as a more important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of the national life. She is more important by far than the successful statesman or businessman or artist or scientist. Would you pray with me? With your head bowed and your eyes closed and your hands raised if you want. The women of East Tucson Baptist Church, you are a supreme asset to our church in our lives. Our church will never be a force for Jesus Christ without your love and leadership and nurturing and motivation. And we thank you and we honor you. Father, we are grateful for the women in our lives. We've suffered so many failures over the time and we're so grateful for your redeeming love and sacrifice and grace. We are grateful, Lord, for the blessing and the grace and honor and sacrifice of the women in our lives who do so much for us, who care so much for us. Father, help us to elevate the position of motherhood, whether, it's a, whether it is a real position by birth or adoption or an a appointed position because a child is childless and needs a mother. May we elevate that position in such a way to remember the importance women play in our lives. Father, more importantly than anything, it is the woman who follows your will that is the most important. So Father, I pray if there's a woman in our church who doesn't know you, they'll accept you as their Lord and Savior. But you have asked men to lead also. So if there's a man here who doesn't know you as, as Lord and Savior, I pray that they will take the first step of leadership and step out and accept Christ for the sake of his family, for the sake of the women in his life, to show them the way as well. More importantly, may, your, may Jesus be proclaimed and honored in worship. For there is no other name in which we can be saved. There's no other name that brings forgiveness. There's no other name that brings redemption in our lives. Thank you for calling to us, softly and tenderly calling us to yourself. We ask this, pray this, and share all of this in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing what is called a song of invitation, a song of commitment. Some churches do this, some churches don't. It's not right, it's not wrong, it just is. And I'm going to ask you to stand. And at home, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment for the Lord. If you don't know Jesus in your life, please contact us if you don't, you don't know how. I, we would like to talk to you. If you have made a commitment and you want to make that public, please let me know. Just just email me at the office or tell your story at etbc.org. But make a decision and honor the women in your life this, today. Let's sing.